Awesome. Uncommon grace. I've entitled my message, The Mystery of God's Grace. Um, and as human beings, I really started to think about the things of God. And they are so mysterious, aren't they? How do you understand really sin? What is sin? Um, how does that separate us from God? Uh, what pleases God? Um, I just think of a story of a, a man who came to Jesus and had kept the law and, and said, what must I do to get into the kingdom? And, and Jesus said, sell all your things. It's like, wow, what, what was happening in that man's heart? Um, and, and of course, the thing that I find so irritating is I get into good space with God and then all of a sudden I find I'm off track. And, uh, and sin that I would, would not have been attracted to a week ago seems to attract me. Do you find that? Um, then um, I realize at a certain point that something I thought was fine isn't fine. And, and judgment, uh, what is judgment? Um, I struggled even to think about eternal judgment. Uh, being um, consigned to, to hellfire. I mean, these are things that, that we struggle with. They are mysterious. And, uh, and then, uh, then balance that with grace and mercy. What is grace? What is mercy? When uh, you actually deserve punishment, and that punishment is withdrawn, where God favors you when you should never be favored. So that's why, by, by God's grace, I'm always in His Word. I'm always having a quiet time. It's why, even if I'm not preaching, I come to the house of God, because I know I need guidance and direction. The question today is, can the worst of worst, the worst of the worst sins really be forgiven by God in a moment of time? There must surely be a limit. There must be a line that if you cross that line, you're gone. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've got my limits. And that scares me sometimes. There are certain things that happen that I find almost impossible to forgive. And so that, that's all about living in this world that we're living in. Do you know that God is prepared to dispense grace and mercy even when every other human being on the planet is outraged and screaming, no ways. I've got a little picture. Um, do you ever feel like that? Do you know that as, a, that as a minister, we have to deal with brokenness when your father was murdered brutally for no reason. When somebody in the church was date raped. Went out, never expected what happened. Um, I think of a story when a, a young girl in our church was sick. I think she was probably just about 20, went home from work, and Truda came in and raped her. Guys, how, how, do we, how do we deal with that? I keep thinking, if someone raped my daughters, I don't know. I think I could become a murderer. No, that, guys, I, I, that, but I'm always telling jokes. That's not a joke. I often think in my own heart as I'm helping people, how would I be? What would be going on in my heart? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to discuss a biblical example of a king in the Old Testament called King Manasseh, who reigned as a king of Judah in the 7th century BC. Remember that Israel was divided into two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. And um, an interesting thing is, he was the most evil king that Judah ever had, and God allowed him to remain on the throne for 55 years. You know, sometimes when there's, uh, there are evil leaders, I think, God, why can't you just stop their hearts? <laughs> why can't they have a heart attack? Um, you guys with me? You, you don't understand. We, we don't understand. Um, scripture tells us that he was far worse than the Canaanite kings that God destroyed when Israel entered the promised land. The story is so ironical because the worst king in the history was actually preceded by the two best kings, Hezekiah and Josiah, on either side of Manasseh's reign. Um, it's almost like that, that 
that bad middle of a good sandwich. Have you ever picked up a sandwich, fresh bread, and you've hated what's in the middle? For me, it's normally liver paste. Um, I don't know if kids get sandwiches for school today, but you know when mom puts Marmite on and you hate Marmite because you've had a million Marmite sandwiches. But that's who Manasseh was. He was the bad in the middle of a great sandwich. Manasseh's father, King Hezekiah, was a godly king. And he wasn't just godly, he was brave and courageous. And he took a stand against the incredibly cruel and powerful Assyrian uh, pagan kingdom. And he defied the Assyrians uh, and to such an extent that God honored him. And in one day, the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 of them. And there was a season of peace, all because of Hezekiah's faithfulness to God. And I don't know if you ever have this thought how can somebody so godly be followed by someone so evil? I'm often puzzled and confused because we had Nelson Mandela and then we had other things. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I still think about Nelson Mandela. Do you know when my wife ran a street children's project, he paid out of his money for every one of those boys to be flown to Pretoria to celebrate his birthday. Um, I still think he hosted a tea party for all the wives of previous presidents and prime ministers who had been the architects of apartheid. How do you understand that? <laughs> I still think about him. But then it all changed. Guys, the biggest problem is presumption. My dad always used to say, there's a difference between faith in God and presumption. And we make a big problem if we just take righteousness for granted. And I always think of the words of God to Cain. It was the first murderer we read in Genesis chapter 4. He said, beware because sin is crouching at the door, at the door and desires to capture your heart. Do you know that in every generation, in every season, sin is crouching at the door. Guys, this applies to individuals, it applies to families, it applies to our church and our, nature, our nation. As Christians, never take righteousness for granted. Don't think because you come to church that your children will. Don't think because you serve God, your children will. Don't take for granted that this church will be a healthy church in 20 years. That's presumption. What God is calling us to do is to pray. You know that a man called Joseph de Mastre once said that people get the leader they deserve. Now this is quite a complicated statement and it's quoted quite regularly, by the way. And it may or may not be true. But I don't think anyone deserves a good leader. I think when we get a good leader, it's the grace of God. I remember how much we prayed before our first election. Surprise, surprise, we got Nelson Mandela. And can I tell you, as we're coming to our general election, God wants us to pray like we've never prayed before. Not from a super spiritual looking down on politicians' point of view, but with the knowledge that the church represents God. And when we pray humbly, and in unity, God hears us. If we want great leaders, we need to humbly ask God for great leaders. And I've just been thinking, actually, just as I was preparing this morning, that maybe we need to have a prayer vigil before the election. Um, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about asking God, please, to give us a godly leader. Parents who are raising children have many things to focus on. Education, getting into school, getting into university, clothing them, you name it. But I want to tell you the most important thing is are your children growing up with a love for God? Will they take the baton of serving Christ onto the next generation? Who's going to be leading this nation in 25 years' time? Who? 
I tell you what, you might think, well, I'm just one individual in a big country, but your prayers could be the very thing that raises up a great leader. Because you know what? Leaders do change a country for, for the good and for the worse. Um, and that's why we're coming down to have a look at the details of Manasseh. 2 Kings 21, verse 2 to 9. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Remember, whether something is sinful or not depends on well, how God sees it. Following the detestable practices of pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites, he rebuilt pagan shrines his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He constructed altars for Baal, set up an Asherah pole. You've got to understand the prevailing popular um, religions turned around the god Baal and the goddess Asherah. And there were such popular religions, and he restored the Canaanite religions to a central point in Israel, just as King Ahab of Israel had done. He also bowed before all the powers of heavens, of the heavens, and worshipped them. Guys, that's speaking about demon forces. Okay, the Bible says that they're in the heavenlies. He built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord. Can you imagine right there in the temple? The place where the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. He built these altars for all the powers of the heavens in both the courtyard, both courtyards of the Lord's temple. He actually took Satanism into the holy temple of God. If I was God, I would have gone bzzzt. Manasseh also sacrificed his own son in the fire. Very nice gentleman. He practiced sorcery and divination, and he consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Verse 7, Manasseh even made a carved image of Asherah and set it up in the temple. The very place where the Lord had told David and his son Solomon, My name will be honored forever in this temple. And in Jerusalem, here we see a repeat of the importance of the temple. The city I've chosen from among all the tribes of Israel. Manasseh, verse 16, also murdered many innocent people until Jerusalem was filled from one end to the other with innocent blood. Guys, that's quite an image. So much murder that the city is filled with blood. This was in addition to the sin that it caused the people of Judah to commit leading them to do evil in the Lord's sight. Guys, I, I want to just for a moment look at the development of evil in his life. Because when I preached on the book of Jonah, I, I struggled to understand why God saved Nineveh. Because still today, they say it's one of the worst examples of what a terrorist group can look like. And uh, I think I preached that message here sometime last year. How does sin develop? So let's start with the fact that he was far too young when he became king, only 12 years of age. And he was a very anxious and insecure young man. And he no doubt lacked support and mentors. Guys, we're living in an age where a lot of people don't have fathers. Um, there's a lot of insecurity. There's a lot of anxiety. And he struggled to trust. This man had trust issues from a young age. He couldn't trust the invisible God and believe in the written word. I want to tell you that one of our greatest jobs is through the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to help other people trust God who is invisible. So he was drawn to the Canaanite religions uh, that served the God of Baal and the God of Asherah. It was a very tangible religion. They would make amazing idols to these gods. So there we are. He starts being insecure and anxious, ends up with trust issues. Then his heart became hardened to the conviction and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that every single human being on this planet can allow their hearts to become hardened? It's not a case of, oh my word, how could that happen? Each and every one of us will find our hearts hardened 
if our hearts are diverted from the worship of the only true God. And what happened was he decided to fill the black hole created by insecurity, loneliness, and emptiness with Satan worship. Many years ago when I was new in the ministry, in fact, my first year in the ministry, I was very green. Jenny and I counseled and worked with an ex-Satanist. And he was a young man in his early 20s. And what had happened was he became a, a priest in the Satanist movement when he drank the blood of a human baby. Yeah. And, oh my hat, this man was tormented. And he didn't know ever whether God had forgiven him. And he explained to us how the Satanist movement had grown. And it was all about lonely, broken-hearted, isolated young people who were pulled in to Satanism. Then let's move on. In an unstable environment, Manasseh began to consult mediums and psychics because of his anxiety about the future. I tell you what, the biggest problem people have is anxiety about the future. Will I get my trick? Exemption. Will I get into university? Will I find a job? Will I find a husband or wife? Will we be able to come out at the end of the month? Will my business be liquidated or will it grow? And the whole big thing is about not seeing the footprints of, of Jesus in our future. And when that happens, we look around. And so what Manasseh did was he began to consult psychics and people who used uh, their demonic powers to so-called predict the future. But you know what? Satan is longing for people to surrender control of their future to him. He loves to receive an invitation to shape our future with as much disaster as possible. Do you know what? I think it's great when Christians receive a prophecy, but in, in essence, we don't need it. The prophecy is there to help us, not, not to solve our anxiety problem, because our lives are in the hands of God. Would you agree? So now, now you must think about Manasseh and many of the evil people we see in our world. How a process begins to gather momentum that ends in disaster. Manasseh was, became demon-possessed, sacrificed his firstborn son in a fire. How did he get there? His father was one of the greatest kings, one of the most honest, God-fearing men. How did he get from there to sacrificing his son? As I've already read, he started an incredible murder bloodbath. He desecrated the temple by setting up idols and gods. You know what the most tragic part, really, of Manasseh's sin was that he deceived the nation. Manasseh is a great example of the effect of leadership. We're sitting here. We're leaders in our homes. We're leaders in businesses. Many of us are leaders in many different areas. We see leadership profile around us. Let me tell you, leadership is influence. And I find it incredibly amazing to think how the nation of Germ Germany was deceived by Hitler to murder so many Jewish people. I mean, guys, it's not as unfathomable as we think. The question is, which leaders are influencing us? <laughs> Who's influencing us? So we influence people, but other people influence us. And what happened was that the whole nation turned away from God. And we read in 2 Kings 21 from verse 12 to 13 that during Manasseh's kingship, God declared judgment on the nation. Sure, we struggle again with the idea of a loving God who judges. We don't understand the power of sin to separate us from God. 
However, because God is love, He overturns judgment whenever there is repentance. Guys, that's going to be my message. That's the message I want you to take home. That when there is real repentance, God overturns judgment. Now, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in, um, in John 16, convicts people of three things. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. All three convictions lead us to eternal life. You have to be convicted about your sin. You have to be convicted about the only righteousness is the righteousness of God. And because God is righteous, He sent His own Son to die for us. That we can never please God with our righteousness. But guys, we have to have a conviction about judgment. When we get up in the morning, we have a quiet time. We confess our sins because of our conviction about judgment. And Jesus often gave perspective, perspective sorry, about judgment. And I want to just mention one little passage. He told Nicodemus that God had sent his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do we all know John 3.16? For God so loved the world. Can I read the next verse to you? God sent His Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. That's why we have church in this community. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him. But anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. But now listen this verse is so important. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. Manasseh loved darkness more than light. He loved evil. And that's the weird thing with us. If we let ourselves go, we love evil be it revenge. I mean, there's just a million things that come down to evil. But we know that judgment is removed when we love goodness. It doesn't mean we're perfect. In fact, the closer you get to God, the more you repent. You do know that, don't you? Because there's more of that inner awareness. Not that we're shamed, we're convicted. And so we keep turning to God. Manasseh actually suffered personal judgment that was planned by God because he loved the darkness more than light. So God sent the commander of the Assyrian army to take him prisoner. We read this in 2 Chronicles 33. A ring was put in his nose and he was bound in a bronze chain in a prison in Babylon. Apparently he participated in a, in a kind of rebellion. Remember that the Assyrians were the overmaster and Judah was a vassal. In the midst of Manasseh's suffering, everything changed. He turned to God. And you know what? God's heart was moved. Let's be honest. After all the suffering that he inflicted and the sin he committed, should he have ever been forgiven? I don't know if I lived in those days whether I would ever want the man to be forgiven. Would you? If your family had been affected by his murder. And I'm going to read a little passage in 2 Chronicles 12, 33, 12 to 13. But while in deep distress, Manasseh sought the Lord his God and sincerely humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed... The Lord listened to him and was moved by his request. So the Lord brought Manasseh back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh finally realized that the Lord alone is God. He finally realized that he could move past his trust issues. That actually there's, always, there's, there's only one person that we can trust and that is God. So let's just have a look at a few points out of this passage. Firstly, God will cause or allow deep distress if it gets us to return to him as a prodigal child. What, what 
distress and disaster and problems do is turn us from green harvest to white harvest. We're actually willing to turn to God. And I sometimes get quite embarrassed when I think of the times I have turned to God because something happened. I just wish that I could always, always just want to love and serve God. But it takes distress to turn us to God. Then our way back to God is always through honest prayer, confession. I don't know if you, any of you watch that uh, sitcom, The Kids Are All Right. Kids are, um, and I love it because um, it's a family that was raised up in the time when I was raised up. And, you know, you can just see similarities. I had a friend who was number 16 in his family, by the way. Any of you think of having 16 children today? Anyway, what, what I always find so funny is that they're a Catholic family, and if the kids do anything wrong, the dad just grabs hold of them and says, get into the car, we're going to confession. And I laughed that one kid came back at three in the morning, he'd been out with his girlfriend, his dad says, you're going to confession, boy. <laughs> now, I don't for one moment want to, want to suggest um, a system where we just go off to the priest and just confess and move on and confess and move on. Because confession has to be followed by repentance. But you know what? A good old-fashioned sense of my actions require me to confess is good. It's healthy. <laughs> it's healthy to get down and say, I confess my sins. Then humble prayer of repentance is a prayer God always listens to. I love the way it said God listened to him. And you know, when we're... When we're going down one of our sin roads, God's not listening. But the minute there's a repentant heart, God always listens. Then God is love. So his heart is always moved when our heart breaks. Manasseh and all his evil became broken and God was moved. I don't understand why God is moved because I don't understand a love that's so high so deep and so wide that it's beyond my comprehension that God's heart could be moved. Then God loves to effect full restoration. You know what? Me, I would never risk putting that man back on the throne. I would say, you know what? I'll forgive you, but park off. You know what? Just kind of do a bit of doorkeeping. Uh, just work in the garden for 15 years. And if we see that you... Fully, fully repented, we'll bring you back. Have you ever said that? I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. You know what? You're forgiven, but just stay a thousand kilometers away from me. That's human, isn't it? So I don't understand God's restoration. Guys, in closing, what I want to do is I want to read the prayer of Manasseh. Now, I want to put this in context. The prayer of Manasseh is referred to in... Two Chronicles as being found in two books that have disappeared. No one, no one can find them, okay? It's in the Apocrypha, but it's not in the agreed upon Word of God that's inspired. So I'm going to read it. Um, Martin Luther accepted it in the Bible. But you know what? If Manasseh truly repented, as the Bible says, this prayer is something that he probably would have prayed. So can I read it? Okay, let's read it. Um, o Lord Almighty, God of our ancestors, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of their righteous offspring, you who made heaven and earth with all their order, who shackled the sea by your word of command, who confined the deep and sealed it with your terrible and glorious name. He started off, by recognizing that there is one great God who created everything. The Bible says in Him we live and move and have our being. The God who created me and can take life away from me at any moment. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what that means? A God who began a process of salvation by choosing a nation. Later on, He chose His Son. Then, what He does he says, at whom all things, sorry, you shudder and tremble before your power. 
For your glorious splendor cannot be borne, and the wrath of your threat to sinners is unendurable. Yet immeasurable and unsearchable is your promised mercy. He balances judgment. He says, I know that sinful men deserve judgment, but your mercy is immeasurable and unsearchable. For you are the Lord most high of great compassion, long-suffering, very merciful, and you relent at human suffering. O Lord, according to your great goodness, you have promised repentance and forgiveness to those who have sinned against you. And in the multitude of your mercies, you have appointed repentance for sinners. So repentance is used in two ways. One, that God changes His mind, turns a 180 degree against His declaration of judgment. In other words, my prayer of repentance will lift the judgment. And He just says it's unbelievable. Therefore, you are Lord, God of the righteous, have not appointed repentance for the righteous. For Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who did not sin against you, but you have appointed repentance for me who am a sinner. That's not strictly biblical. Perhaps the reason why it's not in the Bible. For the sins I have committed are more in number than the sands of the sea. My transgressions are multiplied. O Lord God, they are multiplied. I am not worthy to look up and see the heart of heaven because of the multitude of my iniquities. I am weighed down with many an iron fetter so that I am rejected because of my sins and I have no relief for I have provoked your wrath and have done what is evil in your sight, setting up abominable and multiplying offenses. You know what was so healthy? He realized that his sin had multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. You know how sometimes in our unforgiveness, the Bible says it leads to a bitter root that affects many. We're all affected by multiplying sins. And he said, God, I have offended you. I am a sinner. Then supplication for pardon. And now I bend the knee of my heart. What a, a great expression. I bend the knee of my heart, imploring you for kindness. I have sinned, O oh Lord, I have sinned. I acknowledge my transgression. I earnestly implore you, forgive me. O oh Lord, forgive me. Do not destroy me with my transgressions. Do not be angry with me forever or store up evil for me. Do not condemn me to the depths of the earth. For you, O Lord, are the God of those who repent. You and I serve the God of those who repent. What an incredible way of describing God. And in me you will manifest your goodness. For unworthy as I am, you will save me according to your great mercy. And I will praise you continually all the days of my life. For all the host of heaven sing your praise and yours is the glory of God forever. Amen. You know what happened? God forgave him. God restored him. And what Manasseh did in the latter part of his, of his reign was to restore, to restore everything that was godly to the nation. Although tragically, many people didn't follow him. He honored God. It's still a story of a mercy and a grace that we cannot understand and comprehend. Where does that leave us? I want to, I want to tell you that if any of us here have committed sins that are keeping us from God, please let's repent. <laughs> Confess your sin. Never be afraid of the God of compassion, the God of repentance. But guys, can I take it a little bit further? In this evil world that we live in, we need to be praying for those people to come to God. Can I tell you that if God had to destroy evil people in leadership, we couldn't have enough funerals. Our graveyards wouldn't take them. Right? But what if God changed their hearts? What if they repented? What if that happened? 
and our country change, our nation change. Can you allow your heart to go down that road? Thank you so much for tuning into the service today. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you were encouraged and strengthened through the word. We're so glad that you're part of this ministry. And if you want to subscribe to receive notifications as to when uh, new messages are available, just hit the bell at the bottom of this and subscribe. Um, and share with a friend. Let the word get out there. And I'm so glad that you're part of it. See you next week.